welcome to DMSC Livestream. We're ready to get started with another exciting session. Now, make sure you make the most of this time by asking your questions in that Q&A box during the presentation. That way our speakers can answer them during the live Q&A session that'll follow this workshop as time permits. Now, what are we waiting for? Let's get started. Welcome all, and thanks for joining. Uh, this is obviously a bit of a unique format, my first ever virtual event slash workshop. Wanted to though take a second to, to thank Brian and the PCG team for being creative with this and proceeding to hold this event. I think it's important that as an industry, we continue to collaborate, especially during these uncertain times. That said, I would definitely love to be uh, sipping a beautiful Napa Red right now. <laughs> No, so I think we've got uh, 45 minutes planned and then 15 minutes Q&A, um, so I'll jump right into things. I guess a little background on why we decided to, to do this session. We weren't originally slotted um, to be a part of this event, but we had a bunch of dealers reaching out to us asking, you know, what do I need to do during and after coronavirus in this new world? How can I make my website better? Uh, I can no longer count on, you know, my stud saleswoman to sell 25 cars in the last week of the month and in order to make my, my volume number. And so my website is really my last standing salesperson. And so they asked us, how do I improve my digital presence to capitalize during this kind of new reality that we're living in? So we decided to host this session to talk about how you can, quote, COVID-proof your digital showroom. And again, we want this to be tactical stuff that you guys can start implementing immediately. So... In terms of agenda, uh, quick intro, we're gonna talk about merchandising, we're gonna talk about how that fits into digital retailing. Then I wanna talk a little bit about some alternate profit channels that some of our dealers are investing in with lower volumes and compressing front end margins. Obviously, you know, we've seen projections for the back half of 20 and into 21, from a SARS standpoint, reduced significantly. And so some of our dealers start to realize the importance of maximizing profit on every deal and we see you know, additional opportunities through both accessories and F&I, which we'll talk more about today. Um, and then lastly, we'll talk about kind of seven specific actions you can take along with some other kind of quick tips. Um, so without further ado, I guess quick background on myself because I think uh, it'll be pertinent to what we'll talk about today. I started my career on Wall Street in very you know, typical fashion. Um, started in the investment banking division of Merrill Lynch. I was on their technology team. Uh, where we were brokering essentially M&A deals of, you know, different technology providers. Did the kind of traditional two-year stint um, before taking a role with a private equity shop, where instead of just kind of brokering M&A deals, we were actually deploying our own capital to buy typically controlling interests in medium-sized, sometimes mismanaged businesses. And we did a lot of software as a service. We did a lot of e-commerce. We even did some traditional retail, including a couple of dealer groups. And the reason I bring this up is in that private equity role, one of the biggest areas that we would identify for improvement would always relate to website design and merchandising, which is what we'll talk about today. And I think the reason for that is that these improvements, website design improvements, really have the highest leverage, more so than advertising optimization, merchandising changes are really foundational enhancements. If you improve your website once, every ad dollar you spend thereafter becomes materially more efficient. So that's what we'll talk about today. Enough about me, a little bit about Spin Car quickly. We started in the fashion space. So we used to provide that 360 viewing technology that we're known for, for you know handbag companies, gadget companies. We worked with companies like Louis Vuitton, Warby Parker, Converse. And what was interesting is just that capability to provide a 360 view would still drive lifts of 10 to 25% in conversion rate in an e-commerce setting. We got kind of pulled into the auto space in late 2014 when we had hired a gentleman that worked at Reynolds and Reynolds um, and eventually pivoted to auto exclusively uh, in early 2015. So now we work with a few thousand dealerships, about 60% of auctions in the U.S. and several OEM clients as well. About 75% of our business is in North America, 25% internationally, most of that being in Western Europe and Australasia. 
So I'd say, you know, our perspective that we bring to, to the discussion today is we've worked with a ton of progressive retailers in auto, both domestically and internationally. And we've also worked with a lot of big e-commerce companies. So we'll plan to share some of those learnings today. So before we get into kind of tactics, I wanted to just provide some kind of backdrop statistics to kind of keep in the back of your mind as we progress through the presentation today. First off, I'd say, you know, we're all obviously familiar with this concept that consumers spend way more time online than they do in store. But I think it's important to really quantify that. I think this is a useful statistic. We looked at 5,000 dealers' Google Analytics accounts, and we found that the average dealer on a monthly basis has between nine and 10,000 unique visitors per month, as I said. If you compare that with walk-in traffic, we pulled 500 of our domestic customers. On average, walk-in traffic is four to 500 walk-ins with a range of 250 walk-ins on the low end to 700 on the high end. That means that on average, a dealer is getting more than 20 times the amount of traffic to their digital showroom than they are to their physical presence. And if you think about how kind of incongruent that is, if you really think about the time that your average dealer principal or general manager spends, you know, critiquing their physical showroom, thinking about their layout, which cars are on the front line, you know, which cars are actually parked in the showroom, landscaping. And you compare that to how much time a dealer spends critiquing their digital showroom. Again, it's really incongruent. And, you know, we could argue that a dealer should spend 20x the amount of time critiquing their digital showroom that they do critiquing their physical showroom. But again, nonetheless, an easy takeaway on our, on our mind is to spend more time looking at your digital showroom. You know, we recommend schedule a calendar reminder to review weekly, bi-weekly, during a quiet time at the dealership when you can browse naturally and, and do this on mobile if possible. And I guarantee, again, you'll find two, three, four things that you want to change immediately. So a second statistic that I wanted to mention here, there's a stat that's often quoted about the changing behavior, you know, for consumers that Seven years ago, for example, car buyers on average went to six dealerships before making a purchase. And the adage was, you know, they packed the kids up, go to the Chevy store to drive the Suburban, go to the Ford store to test drive the Expedition, go to the Toyota store to drive the Sequoia. And now, on average, car buyers go to just 1.5 dealerships. I think what's even more interesting than that reduction in the number of visits is if you take sort of the inverse of that 1.5, that means that buyers on average purchase, consumers on average purchase at the first dealership that they enter 70% of the time. That means clearly the majority of the purchase process is happening online. To show you how much work consumers do online versus in the store, this is a big think with Google study showing that on average, consumers have over 29 touch points between when they start a purchase journey before they end that journey. And obviously the vast majority of those are on digital, digital solutions. So you know, I think why we think this is important is digital is clearly where you can win out and really take market share. That said, there's obviously growing competition in digital ad spend, which is why we think, as opposed to, you know, differentiating via advertising, we think the real opportunity for differentiation revolves around merchandising. So before moving on, how you can capitalize on differentiation, though, wanted to share a little bit about the sort of incongruence and in competition on ad spend. This is a, a study from Auto Trader showing the disproportionate relationship between consumer behavior and dealer investment. Consumers spend around 75% of their time during the purchase process online, yet dealer marketing spend is only 12% spent online. Some of this is obviously driven by co-op, but in our opinion, Dollar spent, even you know, cheap advertising due to co-op, dollars spent on underperforming channels just because their co-op is always worse than dollars spent effectively without co-op. We're also happy to announce, I mean, a lot of the products we'll talk about today uh, actually are co-op eligible for the majority of, of US OEMs. So again, talk about some more general kind of backdrop statistics, uh, but thought it'd be interesting to talk about you know, the change that coronavirus has caused in our industry. Um, and really accelerated the shift to digital. I would say what's most interesting to me, right, is, is the change in sort of the auto landscape is not just being seen and reported by auto publications, but major non-auto news outlets are taking notice and recognizing this trend. Dealers have seemingly overnight been forced to figure out contactless delivery, operating 
service, but not sales in some cases, sanitation policies and practices. I would say in our opinion, this is potentially the biggest disruption to ever hit the auto industry. I think the interesting thing about the COVID impact is the prevailing thinking is that consumer behavior change is here to stay. It's not going back. People will do much less in-person shopping and want to transact more and more online. So we think this change in consumer behavior is permanent. The good news is, in our opinion, you know, the industry is acknowledging this change, recognizing the need to accelerate timelines of changes that they've been considering for some time. Like I said, we see at SpinCar, we've had tons of dealers reaching out to us, asking about how we can help in this new kind of post-COVID reality. This stat from the NADA chairman, a quote from the NADA chairman, is what I found most compelling, that he believes 80 to 90% of U.S. franchise dealers will have digital retailing capabilities implemented on their websites by the end of the year. This will represent, obviously, a massive acceleration in the digital retailing category, which coming into the pandemic was probably a paltry 10 to 15% of franchise dealers. Further evidence of this you know, kind of change and disruption is the financial markets are rewarding companies that have embraced this change and have this competency of remote retailing kind of built into their DNA inherently. Carvana, obviously, we know, has achieved massive enterprise value. Vroom had a phenomenal first month of trading with the current price that they're trading at, as this is recorded, more than double their initial offering price. It'll definitely be interesting to see how this all plays out. Traditionally, e-commerce sectors have far more consolidated distribution curves with much more winner-take-all characteristics than traditional industries' distribution models. Some are saying that a market leader in this kind of you know, digital retailing online dealer space will reach a massive 10 to 15% market share in the next decade, which will be starkly different than the distribution that we see today. So how do we keep up with all this disruption that's happening, both in consumer behavior and by you know, some of these disruptive you know, business players? Like I said before, in our opinion, where you need to focus is around website design, is around merchandising. But again, our, our point of view on that is that's where you'll get, like I mentioned earlier, far more leverage. Every dollar you spend will become markedly more efficient. So talking about merchandising for a second, we all see, you know, undoubtedly a shift to digital retailing. But in our opinion, checkout rates on digital retailing products remain abysmally low. As we'll talk about, as will be talked about at length in this conference, um, we've heard countless stories of dealers piloting digital retailing and failing. They're lucky if they sell eight to 10 cars, not monthly, but eight to 10 cars a year through their digital retailing solution. And some of that is process change, obviously, but we think a bigger driver of the lack of conversion through a digital retailing solution is the lack of compelling, transparent, educational merchandising on the website. I think it's foolish for us to expect a consumer to purchase a $40,000 vehicle, again, as we all know, the second largest purchase of many people's homes, if we don't have transparent, effective educational merchandising, which is what we'll talk about today. So what we've seen, you know, talking about the funnel for a second here is we've always seen a lot of investment in kind of top of funnel marketing awareness campaigns in the auto industry, especially at the tier three level. And over the last five years or so, we've started to see a lot of investment in sort of the low funnel digital retailing online checkout conversion tools, where we see a big miss or a big amount of white space for dealers to differentiate is this kind of mid funnel area of merchandising. Again, which is what we'll talk about today. So a backdrop for how to think about merchandising, right? We always think about merchandising as replicating the same experience somebody would have physically in your showroom on your website. So you can't just add checkout capabilities to your website and expect you know, overnight success. You need to think about digitizing your entire sales process along the way. The way we think about this is using the traditional dealer sales process that hasn't changed in you know, 20, 30, 50 years, whatever it is. Everyone is familiar with this concept, right? Of the meet, greet, evaluate, demonstrate, and close sales process or the extended 10 step process that I have on the slide here that includes the walk around, test drive, trade, et cetera. We think it's important to think about how do you digitize your entire sales process? So starting with the meet and greet, the new meet and greet. I think our new industry has done a great job adapting to coronavirus with this, including messages when you land on the site that inform visitors on how are you keeping people safe? How do you make them comfortable, feel safe engaging with you? 
If you don't have one of these, we strongly recommend it. Inform consumers of how they can stay safe if you're offering contactless delivery or you have special sanitation methods or all your employees are wearing protective equipment, for example, or any other practices you're using to ensure safety. And we don't think these types of reminders will go away anytime soon. There's very little downside in continuing to show people this messaging. Maybe you soften the messaging a bit or you don't you know, pop it as a modal screen takeover, but instead have it featured prominently on your homepage leaderboard. Again, we think these are critically important to the, you know, kind of digitization of the meet and greet. Another way, so speaking of kind of first impression, meet and greet, another way to improve the first impression with a consumer is through a professional, consistent presentation of inventory. We've all seen this pervasive photo issue, right? You go to an SRP for Ford Explorers, for example, and half of the vehicles don't have any photos, a quarter are taken from the side, um, you know, another quarter are taken from the front or the, you know, the three quarter angle. This does not convey a sense of professionalism or that vehicles are be being taken care of. And candidly, in our opinion, this is an easy fix. Shooting vehicles consistently will enhance the sense of professionalism, give your site a cleaner look and make it easier for consumers to browse without the distractions of inconsistency. There are software products you can use to ensure that vehicles are shot or displayed consistently and any value added features are consistently captured. Or you can use like a, a shot list that you put on the wall where the photography is being done, you know, or you can mark areas on the floor showing you where to place the car. So you always have a really consistent clean backdrop. Another small tip in our opinion is to always shoot your SRP photos, your main kind of hero image, if you will, shoot those from the direction so the front of the vehicle is facing the details, the written details on your SRP. This is an old ad trick. Your eyes will naturally flow from the back to the front of the car into the rest of the ad or SRP. We also recommend using you know, vehicle feature-based SRP overlays, showing the highest MSRP or most unique vehicle feature on a given car. This will definitely improve, I mean, like up to like 6x improvement in SRP to VDP click-through rates. And we think these, you know, SRP overlays provide a lot more value than the dealer branded overlays. There's tools that allow a photographer to do this while capturing, or there's tools that allow you to automatically apply these, you know, based on the MSRP or the rarity of a feature, for example. So on the topic of photography, obviously, we've seen a huge investment in the last 10 years in photo booth areas. We have some great partners that we work with that build phenomenally um, high quality photo booths. And you know, lighting is definitely important when you start to think about high quality photos, merchandising imagery. Um, some of our dealers are even doing cool stuff where they'll have like a uh, really high end projector that throws you know, up against the back of the wall behind the vehicle, a digital kind of background that shows features or special characteristics of that vehicle or something about a warranty that they offer. We think that stuff makes a lot of sense. We think this looks really professional. That said, some dealers either don't have the space to build out a booth or don't want to spend, you know, the significant capital expenditure to build that out. That said, there's a couple alternate approaches, right? If you don't have the space in your store to build out a full blown booth, or you don't want to outlay that capital expenditure, but your natural environment or background still leaves you know, a lot to be desired, there are new applications that you can use that can help with this. So one application would be using stereoscopic depth blur. Um, we've seen this in portrait mode on the iPhone. Essentially, it allows you to kind of anonymize out the background. You blur out kind of the, the other distractions in the background. It really makes kind of the foreground pop. Another option is full-blown background replacement. Um, so again, if you've got, you know, dumpsters or, you know, distractions or other brands of vehicles or, you know, your competitor in the background, you can use a computer vision based solution that automatically sort of clips the photo out, knocks it out, and then you can put a dealer branded back, um, excuse me, uh, background over it to, to keep it consistent. Another photo tip we recommend is damage tagging and undercarriage imaging. Remember, good merchandising is about replicating the physical experience as closely as possible online. And there's still some contingency of buyers, especially, you know, here where I sit in upstate New York, where there's, you know, lots of potholes, lots of salt on the roads. There's still some contingency of buyers that want to put the vehicle up on the lift, or they're going to, you know, to, to look at what the undercarriage looks like, or they want to inspect every nook and cranny for any possible gravel thing. 
you're better off making that process easy for a consumer on your website by giving them you know, super transparent damage tagging and undercarriage imaging. This alone, you know, we see dealers that implement this that get up to two to three percent lift and conversion rate. So those are some like, you know, kind of photography tips that help, you know, improve the consumer experience. Another photography tip is more of an operational improvement is related to getting vehicles online quickly. This is data from NCM that shows that the holding cost of a vehicle is around $50 or more per day. And that's due to a variety of things, right? Interest expense, inventory opportunity cost, um, the steep depreciation curve on vehicles today. Many photo processes out there take 24 to 48 hours after you capture a vehicle just to get that vehicle online due to feed sinking, um, you know, delays, you gotta wait till a feed process is overnight, et cetera. And that adds up to be a huge, a huge expense in holding cost and missed opportunity. So if you can get, you know, a unique vehicle in on Friday and you don't get it online until Sunday or Monday, inevitably over the course of the year, you will miss out on a lot of people that are looking for that unique vehicle. And that's obviously in addition, the missed opportunities in addition to the you know, hard holding costs. Another good practice here in terms of like getting vehicles online faster is what we call a hot shot, which as soon as you get a vehicle in from auction or take it in on trade, pre-reconditioning, quickly shoot it. You can add an overlay that says, you know, in reconditioning, new photos coming soon, but get it online quickly. Um, and then there's tools that are out there that when you recondition the vehicle and shoot it again, it can kind of automatically overwrite those pre-recon photos. As I mentioned, there's, there's tools that can help a lot of these issues. In our opinion, dealers should get rid of DSLR cameras and use smart applications. I think it's important to remember a lot of times the person at the dealership responsible for photography isn't necessarily a professional merchandiser or marketer. So they may not know that on a pickup truck, it's critically important to shoot a tow hitch or um, if you have a sedan, you should shoot the back seat space because that's what's important to sedan buyers or regardless of what type of vehicle you should shoot, you know, the cooled seat button because that feature has value. These smart tools and applications that are out there can help automatically prompt capture those value added features, taking the guesswork out of the photographer's hands and ensuring that those features are always merchandised well. And that's again, in addition to being able to ensure photo consistency, being able to get vehicles online faster, Etc. And again, even just saving a day or two can be massively impactful. So we talk a lot about kind of imaging and stuff, and we think there's big opportunities in imaging, but there's even bigger opportunities in improved web design. If you look at the overall experience on you know a dealer site, and you compare that to the experience of you know where consumers spend a lot of their time, you know, and Amazon or a Netflix, we feel typically that a tier three dealer experience leaves a lot to be desired. In many instances, you know, you're selling a 40,000, 50, 60,000 dollar vehicle, and yet the experience is uninspiring versus an Amazon who sells, you know, high utility, low emotional connectivity products like, you know, toilet paper and toothpaste, yet they have this incredibly rich, pleasing, delightful experience. So again, we, we think, you know, making your website really user-friendly, intuitive, um, and just remembering that it's website first, right? The website is your first impression and many dealers' websites are still just a digitization of the newspaper. So, so, so some website improvement designs. First off, we think successful digital retailing is, you know, we think the failing of digital retailing is a lot of dealers are just, you know, sticking a checkout button on their website and expecting to transform overnight. And that's not gonna work. You know, we're gonna talk about what you can do outside of you know, merchandising and imagery um, to improve your digital retailing capabilities. So what are some other kind of website tips? The next step, again, if you think about the sort of traditional sales process, meet, greet, evaluate, the next step after the meet and greet is the evaluator needs analysis. I think in the auto sector, we're typically so concerned about asking too many questions to a consumer because we fear we're gonna lose our lead conversion. But if you look at other industries, it's proven that consumers are willing to provide additional information if the implication or promise, if you will, to the consumers that they'll get more value, whether that's you know, a curated recommendation or an answer to a complicated question. Think about Quora or Medium, for example, which are online blog content platforms. During setup for those platforms, when you first sort of you know, log in or create a, create a login, 
you're willing to go through and fill out that you're interested in business, technology, science, along with your preferred length of content, because you know that will yield more relevant and pleasing results. During the purchase process of a vehicle, in our opinion, consumers have legitimate, difficult questions like what body styles right for me. And there's tools that are out there that help them get those questions answered or basically digitize your needs analysis. Another good example is like, should I buy or lease? That's another difficult question for a consumer to answer. We recommend using these tools that help consumers answer these questions and you will dramatically improve the user experience versus dead ending a consumer that comes in not knowing what body style is right for them and you give them no info whatsoever. You can take somebody that's mid funnel, you know, not settled on a vehicle, use one of these kind of needs analysis tools and drive them down the funnel into a VIN uh, by using one of these types of products. Again, Warby Parker is a real innovator in terms of, you know, kind of consumer needs analysis, if you will. They're a big disruptor in the eyewear space and they do this really elegantly. If you go to their site, um, they have a light, quick, fun survey. So it asks you, you know, you're male or female, what's the size of your head? You know, what's your preferred materials? What's the shape of the glasses you want? And consumers are willing to go through this survey because they know it will yield a markedly more personalized recommendation. We also see some of these dealers using these surveys for F&I products. Again, that's a very esoteric or complex part of the purchase process. A consumer is definitely more likely to believe in the value of an F&I product if they went through a light, quick, fun survey and they believe that the F&I recommendation is something that's personalized to them. So this is another way that dealers are you know, starting to use these kind of assessment tools is to, to drive personalized curated F&I recommendations and having a lot of success with it. So moving on from, you know, kind of needs analysis now and thinking about, you know, how are you educating, you know, what's the, the sort of walk around process, if you will, or how are you, you know, teaching a consumer about a vehicle? Imagine, you know, if this was your physical location or your physical kind of purchase process, you'd never allow a salesperson to treat a customer like this. You know, want to look inside the car? Not until you walk around the outside and click through all, you know, 20 exterior photos. Are you looking for a particular feature? Oh, read the window sticker yourself. You know, there's 50 features listed here. You have a question about how adaptive cruise control works? You're gonna have to leave my site and Google it. That sounds ridiculous, yet that's what many dealer sites are still doing to shoppers every day, forcing them to flip through 10 exterior photos before getting inside. They've got, you know, an unprioritized, uncategorized laundry list of features. They're not educating consumers on, you know, complex vehicle features and what those things do. And we understand that websites are you know, inherently limited by OEM templates and OEM requirements. What we'll talk about today is how you can use merchandising to differentiate and kind of break the mold of those standardized OEM templates. Again, think about what's happening online with online retailers from a consumer experience standpoint. You know, this is Carvana's website, obviously. If you look at what they're doing, right, they've got a fully interactive 360 experience. They've got clickable hotspots that are actually above the fold. So on kind of the prime real estate of the website, you've got this super rich explainer content that allows a consumer to educate themselves without having to leave the site about a, you know, to figure out what a particular vehicle feature does. And obviously Carvana and others have spent millions on these studio, studios and have, you know, in-house development data teams that are focused on this experience. And we understand that that's not tenable for the vast majority of tier three dealers. But the good news is there are off the shelf solutions that allow for this type of rich consumer experience without those enormous capital expenditures. This is an example here of how some dealers are building a more Amazon or Carvana like experience without the huge capital expenditure. As you can see, you can rotate the product both on the exterior as well as the interior so that you know allows a consumer to get to whatever they're interested in quickly you've got these clickable hotspots that are called out prominently above the fold to draw a consumer into deeper engagement you've got this like i mentioned full rich pano experience on the inside which you know is seriously intuitive especially when you juxtapose that with a traditional experience on an interior you force somebody to click through teeny tiny thumbnail photos versus using this type of interior experience where very intuitively, if I want to know 
you know, does this have a sunroof? I can literally just look up at the ceiling in my office. Or if I want to see what does the back seat look like, I can, you know, turn around and you know see what that looks like, for example. So now you can see how this customer is interacting with vehicle features. This isn't just a textual laundry list below the fold, but this is highly engaging educational content, which is proven to dramatically improve engagement. A consumer can now watch a video about a vehicle feature directly on the VDP page, getting excited about their new purchase. They, they don't have to leave to you know, Google what a feature is or what a feature does if they're not sure. And we think this is super important to provide this type of information directly on your VDP because vehicles are becoming increasingly complex. It's tough to understand the difference between BMW's accident mitigation system and Mercedes collision avoidance system. So people end up, they come across the BMW with the accident mitigation system, they have to leave and Google that feature. Embedding rich content directly on the site minimizes that need and sticks people on your VDP as opposed to leaving and ending up bounced to a competitor's. Some really progressive dealers are also starting to do that type of stuff and embedding that kind of educational content, even about F&I products directly in the VDP, which we'll talk more about later. Here's another version of this experience, shot in a booth. You can see they're doing damage tagging like we talked about earlier. Uh, also a small UI thing is just the ability to zoom and pan and let somebody drill in on photos and views. Um, candidly, we thought this one was a travesty when we first came into the space, right? We had worked like Warby Parker who sells $99 glasses and, but they let you, you know, they've got 20 megapixel photos that you could blow up on a highway billboard and you can really drill down and see detail. And yet you know, we go to many dealer sites when we first moved into the space and we see $70,000 Porsches with tiny pixelated 240 by 380 photos. So again, not necessarily a lot novel, you know, technology or functionality, but something that a lot of dealers aren't doing is using high res zoom and pan photos. Another big miss we see in the space is dealers not optimizing for mobile. Um, handily, again, another travesty. We see a lot of vendors that will demo products or features on desktop settings to dealers. When in reality, any decision you make should really be mobile first, given that's about 70% of traffic. So, you know, if a vendor's talking to you about a website change or a new product or a call to action change or a design, you know, alteration, you should really be asking for them to show you those concepts on mobile first. And again, mobile, in my opinion, is where the juxtaposition and the merchandising experience is most apparent. If you look at traditional merchandising, like you kind of mentioned earlier, I've got to hunt and peck through these teeny tiny thumbnail photos to find a, fe a feature that I'm interested in. If I want to see if it has a sunroof, you know, I've got to click through, uh, the, shoot, that's not their sunroof, that's the backup camera, click again, shoot, that's the uh, nav system, click again. And, it's just frustrating and it's not easy for you know a consumer to figure out if it has a feature that's important to them. And again, compare that to the really intuitive, you know, kind of interior pano experience. In our opinion, it's kind of night and day on a mobile device. So if you think about again the consumer experience buying a car, as we talked about earlier, they have a lot of questions. You know, should I buy or lease? What body style is right for me? Yet so many dealer website calls to action are exclamatory. They're 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 not asking questions or answering questions rather. So we think honestly a quick UI best practice is to use calls to action that resonate with a consumer, like common questions. Can I trust this dealer? What will my insurance cost? What's my trade worth? That's how you know, the consumer's mind is thinking. They have these questions. And if you can play into that, again, you might see another two, three, four percent lift in conversion. Also on the topic of web design, we think you know, too many dealers have, and Brian's talked a lot about this, disparate tools on the site. So it's not one unified experience. Not only does that not look good, but the tools don't communicate with each other. So if I start valuing my trade, then I want to go into credit, for example. I've got to log in with two different tools, re-enter my information, et cetera. And if you juxtapose that with Amazon, one of the reasons they're so amazing is you're logged in, you know, your credit card and shipping information is all stored. You can literally do one-click purchase versus it's so laborious what we make a consumer go through on a dealer's website. Again, transition to e-commerce is all about answering consumer questions. You know, this will be talked about a lot today, but I think a critical question to answer is, you know, what's my payment going to be? What incentives am I eligible for? All that stuff. You know, what does, how does the payment change with term? We all know call for price went away and, and really, you know, was not a great user experience. Call for price or gated pricing. That's a thing of the past, but many dealers are still hesitant to go all the way and let consumers 
explore transparently which payments you know are they're eligible for, which incentives, et cetera. So we definitely think if you're not going to go full blown digital retailing, you should certainly have a robust payment calculator that includes incentives, et cetera. So talk a lot about merchandising, talk about web design. The beauty of these assessment tools, the beauty of high quality merchandising is when you prompt a user to either input data into an assessment or interact with interactive merchandising, you're able to capture this really granular data about what's important to them. So I can understand, you know, how did somebody fill out, you know, this assessment? They filled out how many miles they drive, how many kids they have, what activities are important to them. And then these are the hotspots and photos that they spent time looking at. And these are the areas that, you know, they zoomed in on, for example, you could start to use this in, you know, how you respond to leads. You can start to use this to facilitate completely customized BDC conversations, sales presentations, F and I menu building and more. So we'll come back to this before we go more on data and these advanced techniques, I guess a couple more just quick operational suggestions. Moving from the front end purchase and starting to talk about kind of post purchase, let's talk for a second about F&I. We think a huge problem in the industry is that the first problem a consumer, excuse me, the first time a consumer hears about F&I is typically after a protracted four hour negotiation. You know, they've already spent more time at the dealership than they planned. They've probably spent more money than they hoped to. They get thrown in the F&I box. And of course they say, no, 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 no. F&I represents more than 50% of your average dealer's gross profit. And yet it's typically a complete afterthought in a dealer sales process. What we've seen some dealers do that have been really successful is start to use tools to educate somebody earlier in the sales process about F&I. So, you know, as I'm on the VDB page, <clears throat> if I'm looking at a close-up image of, you know, the tire wheel, for example, I can start to, you know, have a call to action there that asks, you know, would you like to learn about tire and wheel protection plans? Or, you know, if I'm looking at, you know, the three quarter shot, I can start to teach them about, you know, exterior dent and ding plans. What we see by doing that is dealers that are starting to pre-market F&I see anywhere from like 19 to 25% lifts in F&I penetration rates. And again, the reason for that is a consumer is much more warmed up to this product category. They don't feel like, you know, oh, I'm getting thrown in the F&I box and I'm getting bamboozled. I've already got kind of warmed up to what gap insurance is or what you know, tire and wheel protection is. The other benefit we see is a significant reduction um, in F&I chargebacks as well. So this is you know, an example of what some dealers are doing. Again, directly on the VDP page, I've got you know, video content, I've got graphical content, high level education. Most dealers aren't getting into F&I pricing here but just educating a consumer on what are the different categories of F&I products and, and why are they important. So just like F&I, accessories is another hugely profitable business for dealers that embrace it. Yet for the vast majority of tier three retailers, it's a complete afterthought. I've personally had the experience where I wanted to buy a car cover for a vehicle that I was purchasing new. And I had to beg them to sell it to me. I asked them two or three times and ultimately they let me leave without actually purchasing a, a, a vehicle cup. In an age of potentially lower retail volume, again, through the back half of this year and into 2021, we think it's critical that you maximize, right? If you're gonna sell 30% less cars, we think it's critical you try to make every dollar possible per unit. And we think a great way to look at maximizing profit is through accessory sales. We see some dealers doing things similar to F&I, starting to pre-market accessories. So bring it to the forefront of the shopping experience. Again, consumers will be warmed up to this category before they come in. Some of the dynamic systems that are out there will show you the estimated you know, monthly financing payment if you finance the accessories, which obviously makes it a lot more affordable. These dynamic systems will also show only the accessories that are relevant to a particular year make model that a consumer is looking at. Accessories, you know, similar to digital retailing, which I'm sure we talked about here at DMSC, involve a lot of process change in operational, you know, issues at the dealership. You need to look at things like compensation plans, you know, internal allocation of service hours, obviously spot deliveries will drop. And those are difficult changes to make, but it can become a really material profit center if you invest in it and you do it right. We have plenty of dealers that are doing over a million dollars net 
and accessories. So in terms of like, you know, coping with those process changes, if you're considering building out an accessories practice, one approach some of our dealers have taken that's been really successful to effectuate the process change is they take a GM or a sales manager from a power sports store where accessories are really the lifeblood and they bring them to a whole car point. Another strategy with accessorization is upfitting vehicles proactively. If you've got a vehicle that's got you know, $5,000 of installed accessories, the consumer is less likely to be able to treat that like a commodity and compare it to a seemingly competitive vehicle otherwise. So there's lots of opportunities to get more serious and drive more profit through an accessories business. So beyond accessories, coming back to you know, some of the operational improvements, again, the hope is there's a lot of quick tactical changes that you can make to you know, improve your merchandising, improve the consumer experience, and ultimately capitalize on the opportunity in kind of this post-COVID reality. I think keeping in mind that effective merchandising and the consumer experience really is about replicating the entire kind of physical sales process on your website. So I would think about, you know, how do you reinforce safety through a better meet and greet? How do you just generally improve your merchandising or excuse me, imaging process to make things more consistent? make things more transparent, get things, you know, get vehicles online faster. We think thinking about a digital assessment or needs analysis not only helps the consumer answer questions and improves the user experience, consumer experience, but also gives you rich data on how they filled out that survey. We think using interactive tools is critical, allowing the consumer to drive their own experience, embedding more information about esoteric products like features and F&I so a consumer doesn't have to either feel bamboozled or confused when they come to your store or leave your site to Google a particular feature. And I think, again, really thinking about now being the time to start to build out an accessories practice. And a lot of dealers have thought about that. Other vendors have tried to help dealers do this. We think now in an age when more of the purchase process is moving online, volumes are potentially down, maximizing profit per unit by having a more robust accessory strategy can be really impactful. So with that, um, love to answer questions. In our opinion, no, no bad questions. So feel free to, to shoot them to me. We love talking about this stuff. So um, yeah, really appreciate it. Look forward to, to some Q&A. That was an amazing start to the workshop. Let's go ahead and bring in our speakers to answer the questions that you all asked online. And remember, please keep those questions coming. Welcome to the live Q&A for this workshop. I'm here with Devin Daly to answer your questions. Hi, Devin, how's it going? It's going well. Thanks everybody for attending. All right, great. So one of the questions we have is, how do you measure the impact that website merchandising tools have on a dealer's business? Yeah, great question. And there's a few ways that, that we look at success or, or some of the KPIs that we use to to measure the impact of merchandising. Um, first and foremost, we would say time on site is a great measure of the impact of merchandising. Time on site is well accepted as, you know, really the best proxy for online showroom performance, shows how much consideration and how much engagement somebody's having with your inventory. Obviously website conversion rate, so conversion rate from a unique visitor to a form fill to a click to call, um, that's another really good measurement technique. And then if you're starting to do things like better merchandise your F&I offerings to warm somebody up to F&I product categories prior to entering the dealership, the main measurement there would be F&I attachment rate or F&I basket size. So those are the main measures that we use to, to you know, sort of measure merchandising efficacy. Great answers. Um, so the next question we have is, what's your prediction for what dealership websites will look like in the next three to five years? Yeah, great question. Um, you know, we think much of the future of the consumer experience for dealer websites will really be centered around true data driven one to one personalization. If you think about the main platforms that consumers spend a lot of their digital time in, if you will, places like uh, Amazon, even their Facebook feed or or Netflix, which we consider really the, the gold standard for data-driven one-to-one -one personalization. And even Amazon, again, is selling often low, or excuse me, high utility, low emotional connectivity products like toothpaste and toilet paper. 
yet Amazon has this incredibly you know, personalized, completely tailored experience, yet dealer websites are often selling highly emotionally connected products that can be sixty, seventy thousand dollars $70,000, and yet they have the same flat, static experience, whether you're a 15-year-old new driver or a 65-year-old retiree. We think in the next three to five years, you'll see a distinct focus on richer, true one-to-one -one personalization, along with dealers and OEMs having a real first-party data strategy to harvest all that valuable exhaust data. Okay, great. Going off that, was there anything else you'd like our attendees to know um, besides what was presented or expanding on anything else from your presentation today? No, I, you know, I don't, I don't know if it came up today or not. Um, you know, I think we talked a little bit about one of the, the key values of merchandising, again, is the ability to glean this really, you know, granular data about consumer behavior. And there's a few different ways that that data can be activated. Um, one is by basically empowering custom tailored BDC conversations. So you can leverage data about what photos, features, hotspots, people are interacting with what components of the vehicle they're drilling down into and zooming in on. And you can give that to your BDC or your sales team so they can custom tailor that conversation, understanding that you know, Michelle's a performance buyer because she looked at the engine photo 12 times, the performance spec sheet nine times, and the turbocharger seven times versus Devin's a safety buyer because I looked at a bunch of safety features. That's one activation of that data. What some of our really progressive dealers are doing is using that data to activate tailored ad units as well. So using the same use case earlier, Michelle's a performance buyer, Devin's a safety buyer. If we weren't to submit leads, you'd be able to activate that data to custom tailor the ad unit. So Michelle would get performance centric creative with maybe the horsepower highlighted, whereas I would get safety centric creative with the you know five star best in class safety rating highlighted. So that's just something that I, I wanted to make sure it came through as we talked a lot about today, merchandising best practices. One of the key benefits of merchandising is being able to produce and harvest this really granular data that you can leverage in a multitude of different ways. Great. With everything going on in the world right now, have you seen an uptick in um, consumers using your product um, with COVID and everything through with buying experience? Yeah, absolutely. Um, a lot of people don't realize we actually do quite a bit of business in, in the wholesale industry and well as well. Um, and, and the auction business has actually grown massively during COVID. I mean, if you could imagine, right, bands of more than 10 or 50 people were enacted and these auctions needed to figure out how to merchandise and sell cars online. And so we've actually had a ton of demand um, and a ton of interest from auction customers. But without a doubt, I think retail dealers realize that more of the purchase process is happening online than ever before. Foot traffic is down massively and you can't count on you know, your stud saleswoman to sell five cars on the last weekend of the month to make your monthly sales goal. And so your website is really your last standing salesperson. And so you need to use as effective, transparent and educational merchandising as possible with declining foot traffic to continue to sell in this new environment. Okay, great. So we only have a few minutes left before we go to the wrap up. Was there anything that you wanted to conclude with to our um, listeners today? No, you know, I said I was in a panel yesterday um, and, you know, I said this yesterday. I think, you know, if there's one tip in, in sort of how you can operate more effectively in this kind of post COVID world, I think it's to focus on visualization, right? It's, you know, if you think about VDP interactions and what people spend time engaging with on a dealer website, it's over 80 percent are with the photo imagery visualization merchandising area. And it's that that creates that you know, kind of emotional connection with a product and nudges somebody over the edge to actually purchase. And so in our opinion, you know, if you want to be more successful in digital retailing or you want to, you know, improve your digital experience, focus on visualization, focus on merchandising, and that's going to be the key to success. Thank you so much for your time and for your great presentation today, Devin. Um, it's time to go to the workshop wrap up. I want to thank our speakers and attendees for making this such an amazing session. 
Now remember, this session will be online in just one hour, and then it'll be available for playback for the next 30 days. So make sure you come back and watch it as often as you would like. Now before you go, Brian has just a few short reminders for you. I hope you're enjoying DMSC Livestream 2020, and here's a few reminders. All of the content, workshops, panels, and discussions will be online for 30 days, so come back as many times as you like to re-watch the content. I want to thank all our sponsors who made this live stream event possible, so don't forget to go into the virtual exhibit hall where you can save money on products and services, get live demos, download case studies, and learn about the new products to help you sell more cars in a digital age. Check out the schedule today for our live networking sessions where you can interact and meet other attendees. And let me remind you of three upcoming events. In August, I'm starting my 12-week manager mentoring program, so check out my website for those details. We have the Fixed Ops Marketing Boot Camp in September. It will be a live and virtual experience, so get your Fixed Ops team registered and our exciting Automotive Analytics and Attribution Summit is on schedule for November in the beautiful Breakers Hotel in November. So, hope to see you at one of these upcoming events. Now let's get back to the show.